Welcome back to our video blog. This time we will be discussing psychedelics, as we have done before, with particular emphasis on the history, namely the last hundred years. And we begin in the year 2012 and wind up in the year 2018. It's a 100-year history, and it's quite amazing what happened in these 100 years. The history of neuroscience in its entirety is really reflected in the evolution of our understanding of psychedelic drugs. So in the next slide, you can see that Merck Pharmaceutical Company synthesized MDMA in the year 2012. What happened afterwards? Well, nothing happened. The compound sat on the shelf for many, many years. It shared the fate of lithium, which was also discovered uh, many years before it finally entered the clinical arena. The first documented uh, use of NDMA was with the U.S. military in the 1950s, but it was only used on animals and in classified studies that were not really available for public review. It then appeared on the streets of Chicago in 1970 where tablets containing MDNA were confiscated, but the drug began to seep into the culture as at large in the early 1970s. Appears on the scene a person by the name of Alexander Shulgin, who took MDMA himself in ever-increasing doses in his laboratory. And in the notes he wrote, I felt absolutely clean inside. And there was nothing but pure euphoria. I've never felt so great or so believed that this is possible. The cleanliness, purity, and marvelous feeling of solid inner strength continued throughout the rest of the day and evening. I'm overcome by the profundity of the experience. So this gives you a first glimpse of, as to the power of these drugs. Now, it had to wait until the year 2011 when Michael Mithover completed an FDA and DEA approved trial of MDNA in the treatment of severe PTSD with stunning results. 10 out of 12 patients uh, were so improved that they no longer met the criteria for PTSD. Further work, of course, is ongoing and efforts are afoot to eventually, perhaps in the year 2020 or thereafter, have MDNA be approved by the FDA for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and perhaps other disorder in the future as well. So going back in time, we are now in the year 1938. Albert Hoffman, a chemist with Sandoz in Basel, Switzerland, was synthesizing a number of compounds. He was not pursuing psychedelic compounds, but rather a whole different avenue of psychopharmacology. But um, he made a compound called LSD, which was sitting on the shelf. And something happened in the year nine, uh, 1943, when he accidentally consumed some LSD. And he writes, the first planned LSD experiment was therefore so deeply moving and alarming because every day reality and the ego experiencing it, which I had until then considered to be the only reality, dissolved. And unfamiliar ego experienced another unfamiliar reality. The first time that uh, Albert Hoffman noticed something was wrong was when he was riding his bicycle from the lab to his home and had some uh, strange sensory experiences. He may have uh, touched some LSD on his hands, which may have entered his bloodstream. Uh, he then built on this experiment and ingested uh, LSD at a dose of 250 micrograms, a quite heroic dose. Now, he didn't know any better because nobody else had ever ingested LSD in the history of the universe. So that's the uh, beginning of LSD. Um, the next step in the evolution of psychedelics occurred in 1957 when Gordon Wasson, who was a public relations executive at J.P. Morgan with a deep interest in um, healers in South America, 
went to a trip uh, to Guatemala and Mexico and wrote up his experiences in Life magazine in June 10, 1957. Here's a picture in the slide of J.P. Morgan. Uh, I'm sorry, of uh, Gordon Wesson, who worked for J.P. Morgan. And in the next slide, you see a curandera. Uh, Wesson is taking mushrooms he's receiving from this woman uh, who is handing it to him, named Eva Mendes. In the right background, you see Guy Strasapéan, a French anthropologist who accompanied Wesson on this trip. And uh, he began then to chew the mushroom containing the psychedelic psilocybin. Here you see him taking the mushroom uh, from a cup that was given to him by the curandera as she was praying at the household altar. He chewed them slowly, as is the custom, and his sixth pair took him about half an hour to consume. Here you see um, the curandera, Ms. Eva Mendez, sitting in her uh, meditative posture. She had consumed more than anybody else who was present that evening, but she uh, stayed calm and dignified, often lyrical in her exhortations, sometimes being impatient that the spirits that she was summoning had not arrived yet. You can see the uh, composure of this woman uh, very much adopting a um, meditative stance, as you can see it in Chan Buddhist, Zen Buddhist meditation. Now, psilocybin never really went away, and in 1962, Walter Pankey, uh, early researcher on psilocybin, did a famous experiment called the Good Friday Experiment. Twenty Protestant Harvard Divinity School students were uh, involved in the study. They either received psilocybin or an active uh, placebo, namely nicotinic acid, which causes flushing of the face and the illusion that one had taken an active compound. Um, this experiment was followed up by uh, Dr. Doblin uh, from 1986 to 1989, um, who did a follow-up on the Good Friday experiment and identified all but one of the divinity students who had taken part in the original experiment. And he interviewed them. And here's what he heard. He was told that the experience had shaped their lives and work in a profound and enduring way. So we are now up to the year 1962. And in the next slide, you see the first appearance of Timothy Leary, a psychologist at Harvard, who got a hold of LSD, which he uh, promulgated among his students. And uh, this was the uh, time of the early Vietnam War and the protest movement in America and psychedelic drugs became identified with this movement and in effect became, became somewhat contaminated with the psychosocial implications of the anti-establishment movement. Um, so Timothy Leary recommended to take LSD and eventually drop out the of society and refused to participate in what he perceived as uh, unconscionable uh, fallout from from uh, imperialism and capitalism. And here finally is the appearance of Stanislav Grof, a psychiatrist from Prague, Czechoslovakia, who immigrated to the US in 1967. He was the one who did the first serious experiments and controlled experiments of psilocybin in patients. In particular, he had addressed the need of patients suffering from existential despair and depression and anxiety in the context of a terminal cancer diagnosis. He has written a number of books uh, here in the slide, Rounds of Human Unconscious Observations from LSD Research and Consciousness and the Mystery of Death, together with Ben uh, Lomond. You have a reference here of the MAPS Society 2006. MAPS in the last year or so had a big meeting in Oakland and it's quite amazing how far this group has come in promulgating the use of uh, psychedelic drugs in psychiatry. And the fact that DEA-approved trials are now being conducted 
are in part due to MAPS efforts. Okay, now we are now entering the nuclear, almost said nuclear, the psychedelic winter. In 1970, President Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act and all psychedelics wound up as Schedule I drugs, indicating that they had no known use in medicine and therefore were banned and could not be prescribed by any physician for any purpose at all. And this state of affairs lasted 30 to 40 years, and no research really was done in the United States during this time. Now, Switzerland, being a more enlightened society, continued experiments with psychedelic drugs and uh, were far ahead uh, compared to the U.S., in their insights as to what these compounds can do. Now things turned around in the early 2000s. Here is a 2006 study by Roland Griffiths, a senior psychopharmacologist at John Hopkins University, who introduced psychedelics in uh, promoting and allowing people to have deep mystical experience in psycho in sessions involving psilocybin and uh, use these also then in the treatment of treatment resistant depression as well as addictive disease. These uh, studies are still ongoing. It's very interesting to note that Dr. Griffith is also a um, dedicated meditator and he sees strong parallels between the um, psychedelic experience and the meditative experience there are a number of uh, YouTube videos that you might watch where um, Dr. Griffiths, who comes across as a very nice person, explains uh, his experience with these drugs as well as his meditative experience. So what he observed then is that uh, some people experiencing um, the mystical experience state also uh, report sustained positive changes in personality, in particular in a personality dimension called openness. Now it was thought until recently that personality dimensions are quite unchangeable and stable over the lifetime. However, it appears that the exposure to psychedelics can change um, personality dimensions previously thought to be set in stone particularly increase in openness, which is uh, one of the um, uh, characteristics uh, thought to be quite unchangeable. Openness, of course, is an in incredibly, incredibly useful personality trait to, to be able to modify, as it may allow you to enter new experiences and avail yourself of new knowledge as it comes along. So here is Dr. Griffith saying the core feature of the mystical experience in the strong sense uh, is the interconnectedness of all things, where there's a rising sense not only of self-confidence and clarity, but of communal responsibility, of altruism and social justice, a felt sense of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto you. And those kinds of sensibilities are at the core of all the world's religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions. So quite a program here and quite a hint as to what he believes psychedelic drugs might be capable of. Now we now switch gears. And as the decades roll by and psilocybin and LSD have come back into research, um, researchers were busy developing neuroimaging techniques, and here's the first study ever to look at what happens in the brain in terms of brain connectivity in people exposed to psychedelic drugs. This was done uh, in London, uh, at a college in London, and performed by Robin Carthard Harris as well as Dr. David Nutt, who is the leader of the laboratory. Uh, Carthard Harris is a very prominent researcher now in the psychedelic field. And let us uh, look at a couple of data points here that they generated. Here's the main finding, namely, uh, in opposition to what they had anticipated, namely an increase of metabolic activity in the brain, they found a stunning decrease and a silencing 
of neuronal systems of brain circuits identified with the default mode network, which is located in the medial aspects of the brain. This brain area is highly active when we do nothing. We are not engaged in any particular cognitive task. We are just left, left to our own devices. And usually what this uh, default met, not net, network, network will do is uh, focus on self-referential thinking. How did I do? How will I do tomorrow? What's going on? What, I, what are my fears, hopes for the future, and regrets for the past? It's kind of an internal laboratory of rehearsing social relationships and anticipating the future and reviewing the past. So this area is silenced by psilocybin in this experiment. Very unusual finding and totally unanticipated by the researcher. Interestingly, in meditative states, the same area is also silenced. Um, we have talked about experiments by Judson Brewer at Yale at the time, who found that experienced meditators were able to shut down the default mode network in the meditative states as well, indicating there might be a parallel between the activity of psilocybin and other psychedelics and meditation. So here is another way of putting this. You can see here the timeline, the blue line indicating that there's a decrease in metabolic activity in the default mode network, which correlates uh, nicely with the intensity of the state experience by the experimental subject. Now, uh, Carhart Thayer Harris and Dr. Nutt have gone further and now applied psilocybin in treatment-resistant depression and have found some positive findings. Namely, there is a subset of patients highly responsive to psilocybin, and here you can see that this positive response uh, in depression correlates with a decreased activity in metabolism in the amygdala, that area that processes usually scary and uh, unsettling emotional experiences. And you can see here another finding whereby an increase in the medial prefrontal cortex connectivity uh, uh, predicts the response at uh, week five in patients with severe unremitting depression, indicating that it's uh, network connectivity that is being tapped on into by psychedelic drugs, which heralds the successful resolution of treatment. Now, in the meantime, basic researchers have been busy and have found that they could uh, identify the binding site of LSD to the serotonin receptor. And they can show that the binding is such that it predicts that LSD will stick to this serotonin receptor um, 5-HT2 for extended periods of time, um, which may be the corollary of the fact that the LSD experience lasts for hours and hours, much longer than the psilocybin experience usually does. Now finally, as a um, ringing out of this brief survey, uh, Carhart Harris has gone even further, has uh, teamed up with a mathematician, Selen Atasoy, um, from uh, Spain, who have uh, developed mathematical models, which show that there seems to be a widening of the repertory of states that the brain can enter under the influence of LSD. Well, we don't have time and space at this point, now this is the year 2017, to uh, analyze this in great detail. However, the summary states that the active repertory of brain states under LSD closely follows power laws, indicating a reorganization of the dynamics at the edge of criticality. Criticality is a technical term indicating that um, brain states are designed in such a way that they are close to the edge of chaos, where brain circuitry might go unstable but it's close to that edge that the brain is most productive, most creative, and most amenable to change. So this was the year 2017, and now we enter the year 2018.
uh, one more study here coming out of Switzerland. Uh, the laboratory of Dr. Wollenweider with collaborators in Germany. And here shows that a 5-HT2A receptor uh, activation by LSD changes the ego boundaries of people involved in a experiment using avatars and um, artificial environments uh, indicating that relationships, interpersonal relationships, might change in response to a decrease in ego boundaries produced by psychedelic compounds. So if you step back and look for from the year 2012 to the year 2018, you have seen a stunning advance in our understanding of these drugs. And if it hadn't been for the winter of um, psychedelics from 1970 to the early 2000s, we may have advanced quite a bit further. So the hope then is that these compounds can be utilized in psychiatry to advance our standing, our understanding of the brain and be potent therapeutic agents perhaps in allowing a resetting of uh, crystallized and frozen brain connectivity circuits that lead to depression and other disorders. Thanks for your attention and we'll see you soon again at a talk here at Behavioral Health 2000. Welcome back. Uh, we will talk today about a drug called psilocybin as well as LSD. Now in this country, of course, psilocybin and LSD are classified as uh, Schedule One drugs, which means they're totally illegal to use. And even researchers have a very difficult time getting their hands on these compounds to investigate what they actually do uh, in the human brain. Uh, there was a flurry of research activity in the 1960s, perhaps not surprisingly <clears throat> because of the uh, culture of the time, into the effect of psychedelic drugs. Then uh, these drugs were banned, classified as Schedule I, and the entire enterprise uh, collapsed. It's only in the last few years, both in Britain, uh, especially in uh, University College London, where Dr. Nutt and Dr. Carhart Harris have been doing pathfinding work on both psilocybin and LSD, but also here at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Roland Griffiths, uh, who will you, you will meet shortly here uh, in one of his uh, videos, have resumed research on the psychopharmacology of psilocybin. And I promise you, this, these drugs actually have some stunning effects um, not only psychologically and pharmacologically, but also in terms of our concepts as to how the human mind works. In addition, they promise to perhaps uh, lead us in new directions in the rapid treatment of depression as well as drug addiction. So I will unpack this for you in the next few minutes. So in the first slide here you see the magic mushroom. It's been estimated that these mushrooms have been used perhaps for 2,000 or more years by indigenous people for religious ceremonies. You of course know that they induce visual hallucinations, dissociative symptoms, uh, feeling of oneness and other mystical types of experiences. The psilocybin story kind of came back to life with some studies on very difficult and terminal patients who suffered existential anxiety and profound depression as a result of terminal cancer. And in this patient group, uh, some exceptions were made in making psilocybin available to researchers. So here's a pilot study on psilocybin treatment for anxiety in patients with advanced stage cancer. The key finding here is a reduction in depression score, 
uh, which became significant six months down the road, hovering um, at the significance level but not quite making it. Now the reason for this is that the doses used were very conservative. Uh, Dr. Griffiths would call, call these low-dose experiments and he has shown that higher doses are required to elicit these powerful antidepressant and uh, mystical experience inducing um, uh, properties of the drug. Nevertheless, it's interesting that a single administration of a compound had an effect that became apparent six months after the administration of the drug in the face of a deteriorating and difficult terminal cause of cancer in these patients. So this is a remarkable hint that something is going on in transforming the experience of these patients with regard to their life and their disease. Next slide. So Dr. Griffith uh, followed this up and also used uh, psilocybin in the treatment of existential distress associated with cancer. And um, in the next slide, I show you some of the results. Well, here is the, uh, the reference that you can click, which will lead you to the PDF file uh, collected among our presentations. The next slide shows you some of the findings, namely, um, the idea that how meaningful was this experience and many patients rated the psilocybin experience as among the top five or top ten experiences in their life. So the birth of a child, getting married, getting your PhD, getting promoted, uh, passing your driver's test uh, didn't hold a candle to the power of the experience of uh, ingesting a high dose of psilocybin. Now, other enduring changes that were observed, personal changes in well-being, were also seen, and in a substantial proportion of participants. Now, these changes were of long duration. Follow-up studies have shown that changes in mood, anxiety, and general adaptation to life were persistent after a single exposure to the drug uh, for 12 months or perhaps even longer. In the next slide you'll see some of the results that Dr. Griffith presented and I stole some of his slides here. So about 80% of patients rated the experience as among the five most personally and spiritually significant of their lives and 90% reported increased life satisfaction and positive behavioral changes, including increased positive mood and better social relationship. Now, there is no drug in psychiatry that can do this, either as a single exposure or over a prolonged course of treatment. So although these are preliminary findings, they are shining a powerful laser light into a dark corner of psychopharmacology that has remained largely unexplored since the 1960s, which is like 50 years plus. Uh, perhaps we weren't ready to address these issues. Uh, perhaps the zeitgeist has changed sufficiently to allow us now to proceed with these studies. Now let's go into some more findings and mechanisms. Here um, is a improvement in depression. And you can see that low dose of psilocybin had a marginal effect. Again, single exposure, whereas high dose, 92% of patients reported a significant reduction in depressive symptoms. Now this is unmatched, perhaps only approximated by a single infusion of ketamine Interestingly, ketamine also being a uh, psychedelic, in a sense, uh, with a likelihood of uh, producing some hallucinatory and dissociative symptoms. And furthermore, 
the effect was persistent after six months in 80% of the subjects. In other words, there was very, a very small loss of efficacy, uh, perhaps not statistically significant, in the initial positive powerful reduction in depressive mood. This effect then being sustained for six months. Now, ketamine cannot do this. Uh, Ketamine-treated uh, patients will uh, relapse or will redevelop symptoms after some period of time, uh, at least with the current paradigm of how ketamine is administered. But in this case, a single exposure is like a uh, targeted missile um, into um, a specific site. It has the effect of resetting the brain in such a way that, uh, that depressive symptoms were basically abolished in this small group of uh, volunteers for a six-month period of time. I think you might agree with me that this is worth looking into. If we can somehow develop or tap into this mechanism without any of the potential psilocybin side effects, that is worth doing. That will be a superior treatment outcome to even uh, many of the uh, stunning advances that have been made in general medicine with regard to therapeutics. Now, to uh, sweeten the pie even more, uh, Dr. Griffiths has begun to study the effect of psilocybin on smoking cessation. Now, you know that smoking cessation is almost impossible. Once somebody is addicted on nicotine, he or she can't quit. It's been rated to be more habituating than perhaps even heroin. But in this at least small group of folks, there has been a significant impact of ability to quit and stay quit as assessed by urinary um, cotinine excretion, this being a metabolite of nicotine. In other words, not just relying on the patient's report, well, I didn't smoke, doc, but on verifying that there's no nicotine metabolite in this person any longer. And you can see that there's a flat line here. These patients have stayed quit after a single exposure to psilocybin. So somehow that needs to be explained. What happens in the brain? What is this reset button that allows, number one, a, a sustained decrease in depression over time, as well as the ability to quit nicotine and continue to abstain for an extended period of time. Now, we will speculate a little bit in this talk about the possible mechanisms, but I don't believe we are close to really knowing the total story. Now, let's go to the anchor paper of this talk. Neural correlates of LSD experience revealed by multimodal neuroimaging. So this is a paper originating at University College in London in uh, Dr. David Nett's group, uh, the uh, primary author being Robin Carhart Harris, who had previously published a paper on psilocybin. Um, and um, intriguingly enough, the psilocybin effect on brain function mimics that obtained by experienced long-term meditators. So here then, he was throwing the kitchen sink uh, of imaging, namely um, MRI, fast MRI, and um, uh, magnetic uh, imaging, as well as encephalographic imaging, uh, studying what does LSD do to the brain, how, what is impacted, and can we draw some conclusions about the mechanism leading to hallucinations, the sense of dissociation, the sense of mystical experience that these drugs tend to produce. Now, as it turns out, LSD has a high affinity for a range of receptors, but the highest of all is the serotonin 2A. That's where the action is the highest affinity, the biggest bang for the buck. And here then is a model of this. 
uh, this is again a clickable reference that will pop up when you go to our presentation page. You can inspect this uh, paper for yourself. Now psilocybin is inactive until ingested and it's uh, converted by the body into psilocin. And here we have the different receptor affinities plotted and the theory says that in the cortex between layers 1 and 6 we have a network of uh, cells, neurons, which harbor the serotonin 2A receptor. And by blocking this receptor, we can influence the bold or the blood oxygen linked system in the brain. These are the beautiful pictures you see in functional MRI scans. And then the next slide. Here now we begin to look at the LSD uh, paper from University College of London and the first finding is that there is a relationship between complex visual imagery that the patient is experiencing and the uh, total blood flow in the visual cortex. Now that wouldn't be all that surprising except that the images are not produced by sensory input. Think about that. Um, primary visual cortices get turned on by signals coming from the retina via the lat lat lateral geniculus being transmitted to V1, V2 and up the chain of command in the visual hierarchy. These signals are generated internally, most likely in cortical or close to cortical regions. and Nevertheless, there are signals then that go from the hierarchy, the higher hierarchy center in the cortex back to the early visual cortices and turning on blood flow there. This finding may very well relate to the elements of what is called predictive coding or predictive processing. We have a series of three talks on the Bayesian brain, which talks about the notion that uh, the way we perceive the world is not as we intuitively think it is. That we have a barrage of stimuli coming in, such as photon into the retina. And these are processed uh, first in the retina, then in the visual cortex, and being brought up a chain of command until they come to the higher and higher cortices, where somehow then the image is reconstructed. The thinking now is that the cortex already has multiple models at different levels of the hierarchy predicting what the visual image might be. And the incoming signal from the retina is evaluated in terms of its correspondence. How well does it match the prediction that the brain already has about the incoming visual input? And what is transmitted to the higher centers is not the entire barrage of incoming sensory information, but rather the error terms, that which cannot be explained away by the model already resident in the cortex. So it then makes sense that if the action of psilocybin is on higher cortical areas, that this uh, feedback loop that is always very active from the cortex to V1 and V2 would be turned on as well explaining thus the increased blood flow in early cortical visual areas in the absence of corresponding visual stimuli. Next slide. So this now shows you the relationship between the complex visual uh, imagery and changes in resting state brain connectivity, which microchips talk to each other as you're just sitting there, not being involved in any particular cognitive task. And as you can see, there are significant events going on. Uh, if, you can, can, if you can pair control and uh, patients on placebo. So in multiple areas here are differences showing up in cortical regions indicating that the wiring diagram of the various cortical centers has been altered 
by exposure to LSD. And it is that change in wiring that allows now the production of these internal experiences that we um, feel as, uh, as a mystical sense of oneness, of awe, um, of uh, visual hallucinations, of ego dissociation or ego dissolution, and so on. In the next slide, uh, we have another expression of this, this time uh, plotting the um, decreases in connectivity in, uh, from uh, frontal cortex to other areas in the brain as a function of ego dissolution. Now, ego dissolution is a complex term, um, referring to a sense of having your channels wide open, um, being able to let go of pre-identified notions of how things should be and, uh, and other constructs as well. But you can see that changes in the connectivity, again here LSD versus placebo, in different brain regions correlate with the subjective experience of ego dissolution. Uh, there's a corollary here, namely in advanced meditators, often a sense of a decrease of investment in the own self is noted, and an opening of channels and connection to other people. In uh, Buddhism, this is a big deal. Uh, in fact, the Buddha, 2,500 years ago, stated that there is no self. The self is an illusion created by our mind. Today we would say created by our brain circuit. Now, um, it's always somewhat speculative to correlate statements made 2,500 years ago to a neuroscience finding with a, with a um, hallucinogenic drug. However, there is a bridge between those two statements and that is the effect of meditation on the brain. In fact, uh, experienced meditators uh, ex uh, express a sense of ego dissolution with similar hallmarks in the connectivity of different brain centers which correspond to the LSD experience. And I will show you the same finding in psilocybin shortly. Next slide will show you a more detailed this is the kitchen sink thrown at the, with various imaging modalities. Um, just to say that different ways of looking at the brain um, using magne magnetic waves, electrical waves, blood flow, all point to the similar conclusion of a massive rewiring of different brain centers to each other while LSD is present in the brain. This is the uh, magnetic uh, uh, encephalography result. Uh, we will not belabor this in some detail now and move on to a finding also coming from the same group at University College London where you see a decrease in activity in the so-called default mode network and the midline structures of the brain in response to psilocybin. So this corresponds then to the LSD case as well. And in the next slide, you see this very dramatic decrease in uh, blood flow and neuronal activity in these midline structures after psilocybin exposure. In fact, these are the same areas that have been shown uh, by Brewer in a PNAS paper that we discuss in our meditation talk to also be tuned down in experienced meditators. So perhaps one can employ the psilocybin experience as an adjunct or as a, as a facilitator of entering the meditative practice. And that's one of the research area that Dr. Griffiths is currently pursuing at Johns Hopkins. Here's again another way of putting this. This is kind of the iconic finding. You see changes in the default mode network here that are so typical for the meditative state. 
um, and the decrease in brain in mind wandering that uh, leads us also to distraction. The next slide is a reminder of the default mode network. Uh, here are the findings, meditation versus control. This is the study by Brewer and as you can see here the posterior cuneus is uh, shut down basically. The same area is also shut down in psilocybin. So this is Brewer PNAS. This is Carthard Harris PNAS one year later. And it's thought that this shutdown of the midline default mode network correlates with a decrease in self-referential processing or thinking. So when you close your eyes and you try to meditate on your breath, you will notice within seconds a barrage of images or distracting thoughts that usually have to do with yourself. Your fears, your anticipations, your worries, um, your plans, the past and the future, anything but the here and now. So what meditation then does is progressively allow you to train your default mode network to cool down uh, under command and relieve you of the self-referential uh, processing that uh, drives us to distraction at times. The next slide. Here is a brief video that I'd like for you to watch now that shows you a cartoon on the default mode network. So I'll see you on the other side of this video. What's going on inside your head when your mind wanders? While it may feel like flipping on a screensaver, our brain is still very much at work. In fact, a particular group of brain regions actually increase in activity whenever we aren't focused on a task. This is known as the default mode network, and the functional connections typically include the medial prefrontal cortex, medial parietal cortex, and medial temporal lobes. There is still much debate as to what these cortical associations mean, if anything at all. One theory implicates them in introspection and mind-wandering, essentially our stream of consciousness. This includes any thoughts not directly associated with the immediate external environment. Much of our waking hours are composed of stimulus-independent thought, whether it be daydreaming, planning out our future actions, revisiting memories, or just listening to yourself narrate out your day. Another theory posits that the network's activity is the brain's baseline of processing and information maintenance. Separate from conscious thought, these activations would represent how our brains consolidate experiences and prepare to react to the environment. We're exposed to a constant stream of information from our surroundings, so maybe the default mode network activations are somehow in charge of making sense of it all. But even though neuroscientists haven't completely agreed on what the default mode activations mean, it's clear that resting state research is bursting with potential and applicability. Various psychological disorders, including ADHD, schizophrenia, autism, and Alzheimer's exhibit different types of abnormal functioning in the default mode network. In the end, there are many interesting directions to take resting state research, from picking apart the neural correlates of consciousness to uncovering better ways to detect, understand, and maybe even treat psychological disorders. So welcome back. You have uh, viewed the video on the default mode network. So let's briefly then look at the relationship between psilocybin and meditation as it's being studied currently at Johns Hopkins. So meditation um, is a powerful approach of investigating the nature of mind. It's a tried and true course of discovery. And Dr. Griffiths is fond of saying that psilocybin then would be the crash course in this experimental regard, a way of experimenting on the nature of mind. Uh, you can extend some of the thinking into more speculative areas, such as the idea of the entropic brain. Dr. Carhart Harris is not only a 
very clever experimenter, but also has a theoretical bent. And I encourage you to use the clickable paper here to look at his thinking in borrowing concepts from thermodynamics, um, similar to Dr. Friston, who also has a uh, mathematical uh, framework adapting um, the mathematics and thoughts from thermodynamics on the predictive coding or predictive processing um, theory of how the mind does its work. And so here is now kind of the summary of this theoretical paper. The idea is by various imaging studies to show that psilocybin uh, will allow the brain to engage in a more free, unconstrained way of thinking uh, by decreasing the activity of the midline structures of the default mode network, uh, which also may relate to oscillatory power, especially in the alpha band. Um, so all these uh, findings of magnetic, electric and blood flow domains are related and all point in the same direction that psilocybin will shut down this particular area and allow your mind a new freedom in opening what used to be called by Huxley the doors of perception. So this then is our talk on psilocybin and LSD and the directions that it may point us towards. Namely, that there might be tremendous powers in very rapid resetting of the brain, both with regard to depression, with regard to um, addiction, and with regard to adjusting to extremely difficult life circumstances such as, such as terminal cancer. Uh, it's very intriguing to look at the link between this rapid reset of mental attitude and improved adjustment to the proposed notion of the end of suffering. Uh, we have done previous lectures on sleep and I want to remind you here about what happens in sleep in the first slide. You see that during sleep there is a breakdown of the cortical effective connectivity, meaning that uh, during non-rapid eye movement sleep, when you are really unconscious and not in a dream state, there is a, uh, a response uh, that is uh, different uh, to the normal waking response in the sense that uh, uh, parts of the, contact, the cortex are disconnected from each other. In other words, the um, signals in the brain lead, uh, lose complexity and uh, connectivity. In the next slide, you see how this is being tested. Now, this was work originally conceptualized by Dr. Massimini in Italy in uh, collaboration with Giulio Tononi from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Tononi has made uh, repeated uh, appearances already in our lecture series. So here is the idea. You stimulate the brain here with transmagnetic stimulation. You introduce a rapid magnetic pulse which triggers a small electrical storm in a regional brain area. And the response of adjacent areas is to reverberate. Uh, areas that are connected to the site of impact will be impacted, of course, by the sudden electrical disturbance in the field. And you can see how this reverberates over time into different brain regions as shown here. So the signal migrates to different areas as the milliseconds elapse. So that is the test. This tests which areas are connected to which areas and at which level of complexity. We will unravel the idea of complexity as we go along in the talk. And here in the next slide you see what happens during non-REM sleep. That sleep in which you are deeply unconscious 
there is no activity going on uh, in your mind, you are basically gone from this world. When you do the transmagnetic stimulation in this particular state, you can see that the signal remains local. It's not going anywhere because there is a decoupling of brain areas, brain areas that are connected to each other during conscious states, uh, uncoupled during unconscious states. Here's another way of showing this. You see in wakefulness the reverberation waves migrating through cortical regions over time. Here is sleep stage one, light sleep, and here is non-REM deep sleep. You can see here the signal of the impulse accumulating on the left hand side and the complexity of this area is decreasing significantly. In the next slide uh, you see a summary, namely an intuitive distinction has usually been made between conscious level, how conscious, how, how conscious are you or how aware are you, and the various conscious contents that you can report on when somebody asks you what's going on in your mind. And usually studies have been addressing these issues separately. You remember we have done a lot of uh, slides on the idea of the minimal contrast between a stimulus that is perceived by the experimental subject and one that is not perceived. And we have uh, introduced you to the work of Stanislav Dehaney, who has delineated in great detail uh, what happens in the brain, in the global workspace, when a stimulus is suddenly perceived, there is an explosion, a ignition in the global workspace which propagates or broadcasts a signal to widely distributed cortical areas. And in his view, that is the hallmark of consciousness or becoming consciously aware. However, this is not the same as vigilance or being alert and quote unquote conscious. In the next slide, I show you how you can conceptualize this. So here you are right now as you listen to this talk. You are consciously awake. Your vigilance levels are high. Your eyes are open. You are paying attention. And you are, uh, you are aware of a great deal of highly differentiated uh, content as you listen to this talk. Now here you have other states of mind. For example, REM sleep. Now, in REM sleep, you are conscious, believe it or not, you have vivid dream experiences, but of course, you are less vigilant, you are less awake and attuned to the environment. In fact, you are disconnected from the environment. And here you have another sleep stage, namely slow wave sleep, which is the deep sleep where nothing happens in your brain and you might as well be dead or deeply unconscious. Now here is general anesthesia and coma, where there is zero vigilance and as far as we know, zero content. So there are then these two dimensions of consciousness, vigilance and being conscious and the specific contents of your consciousness. Now, I need to introduce you to this particular measure that you encountered a few, a few slides back, which has since been formalized uh, in a mathematical way. It's called the Perturbational Complexity Index. It gauges the amount of information contained in the integrated response of the thalamocortical system to direct perturbation. Now that's a mouthful and I will unpack this for you so you understand what's going on. It's a very important measure that's increasingly being used in the study of patients with apparent loss of consciousness who nevertheless may be aware and may have conscious content. The next slide, you see uh, the stepwise procedure that is utilized in implementing this PCI, Perturbation Complexity Index. So you do a recording uh, of the brain's activity in response to a trans, uh, transcranial magnetic impulse and you record the uh, cortical perturbation with a high-density EEG. 
So these are like 200 plus electrodes distributed over your scalp. Now then you capture the signal, the time series coming from all 200 plus electrodes and you model this in a, a specific statistical instrument that allows you to extract a matrix that describes the time series over these different electrodes. And here is now in number three the critical step. Any time series or any series of data can be simplified or compressed with an algorithm. In this case it's called the lempel ziff complexity uh, algorithm. Uh, you know that when you use a zip file you can compress a large file into a much smaller size which is more easily transmitted over the internet and can be unpacked at the receiving end. Now data come in either high complexity or low complexity and the algorithm that condenses these files and shortens them in a way uh, will respond to the complexity inherent in the data. In fact it will is, it allows you to generate a number that is called the complexity index. The more algorithmic complexity there is in the data set, the more work the ZIF, uh, the ZIP uh, algorithm has to do, the higher the complexity index is. So this then could be a potential gauge for the level of complex information in the EEG signal derived from patients in different states of consciousness. So the uh, PCI is expected to be of low uh, value when there is a loss of integration because in this case the matrix of activation engaged by TMS is spatially restricted and I showed you that the signal gets stuck right where the impulse is directed, it doesn't migrate. It will also be low if many interactions that occur down the road in different areas in the cortex are stereotypical. They have the same waveform over and over again and that will be called a loss of differentiation. So we have two items, a loss of integration and a loss of differentiation. These are important items to remember because we will get back to those when we discuss in our next lecture on consciousness the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness by Giulio Tononi, which is increasingly uh, drawing adherence to itself because it makes uh, specific predictions which can be tested by experiments and it is mathematically rigorous, which is the first uh, theory of consciousness ever to lend itself to mathematical treatment. Now in the next slide, you see um, an application of this perturbation complexity index. Here you see the signals derived after a perturbation by TMS and you see here the matrix over the different electrodes and time periods involved and you see here you apply the left ziff compression algorithm and you wind up with a number called PCI in this case 0.5 Five. Now in the next slide, I show you the fine structure. If you go into a specific time slice and you blow it up to larger magnification, you see the inherent complexity that is not really visible in the raw data here. The algorithm will have more work to do to compress this data to reduce the inherent complexity. If you do the same thing in non-RAM sleep, i.e. in a non-conscious state, you see the signal is dramatically reduced and the complexity of course is significantly reduced as well yielding a smaller number for the PCI. So here's then a, uh, a test of all of this using different anesthetics. As you know, anesthetics induce an unconscious state. So you would expect that the PCI should be low if you use this experimental procedure in the algorithmic compression and that's in fact what you see. In wakefulness the PCI hovers between 0.5 and 0.6 and all anesthetics here, midazolam, xenon and propofol are all significant lower as is 
as we discussed earlier, non-REM sleep. So this then is a experiment and a mathematical analysis of the experiment which uh, lets you verify predictions that your model makes about what is consciousness in the brain. So here now is the paper. Now this is a very recent vintage. We are now in uh, April of 2017. This just appeared a few weeks ago uh, in a major magazine here and it talks about increased spontaneous uh, um, magnetic uh, encephalographic signal and it, the impact of uh, psycho active drugs or uh, psychedelic drugs on this signal diversity, in other words, on the complexity of the signal. Now, in this experiment, there is no transmagnetic stimulation because the authors feel that the disadvantage is that in the, in the uh, transmagnetic approach, you need brain stimulation, which limits is its practical application in the real world, quite frankly, because you need to hook patients up to a transmagnetic stimulation machine. So they have developed an approach where they measure signal diversity of spontaneous neuronal activity. Now I will not sub subject you to the math and the different algorithmic kinds of things that need to be done to extract this, but the principle is the same as the one used in the previous papers that used transmagnetic stimulation as the perturbation uh, index of complexity. In the next slide, uh, you can see the prediction LSD, psilocybin and anesthetic to sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine normally have profound and, uh, and widespread effects on conscious experience of the self and the world. More specifically, they appear to broaden the scope of conscious content vivifying imagination and positively modulating the flexibility of consciousness. Here are three papers that you can click on that will pop up the PDF files for these exciting research papers. So, of course, since the 60s, there has been the, the claim that um, these drugs, these psychedelic drugs, expand consciousness. Uh, That's the famous quote by Huxley, at the gate of perception, that the doors of perceptions are being opened by psychedelic drugs. And there may be a widening of consciousness and an increased sense of openness. In fact, there is often a change in the personality structure of uh, people who undergo a psychedelic experiences. Um, most pronounced in the domain of openness, openness to new experience, an increased flexibility of mind. And this has been attributed to a kind of reset button in the brain that leads to a more broader, expanded consciousness uh, that is not available necessarily in the normal waking conscious state. And I'll show you only one slide with the overall result, and that is right here. But before we get there, um, here is the description of the experiment. It's very straightforward. Uh, patients took uh, one of three drugs, LSD, psilocybin, or ketamine, and um, then the complexity of uh, EEG channels is analyzed, just as we discussed before. And the result here summarizes the entire story. What is shown here is the statistics of the Z complexity, the ZIF algorithm complexity, mapped onto brain regions. So wherever the complexity is greater than in a control experiment, you see red colors. For example, in the psilocybin case here in the posterior cortex, you see a signal in the uh, pecunius, you see a signal and some signal in the uh, medial frontal lobe. Same is true for LSD, but the signal, as you can see, is much more pronounced and much more widespread. And, to my surprise at least, ketamine 
seem to be the clear winner. So ketamine has a very extensive increase in complexity, not only in posterior region, but also anterior regions, medially and the entire cortex really as a whole. And now, as you know from previous lectures, ketamine is also a drug which leads to a very rapid antidepressant response, unmatched by anything else in psychiatry. And perhaps there is a linkage here between the broadening of complexity or the broadening of consciousness, the increased openness and flexibility of the mind to the putative antidepressant effect of ketamine. So this kind of experiment may lead the way to track the changes from a receptor such as the NMDA receptor to which ketamine binds, to increased amper firing in the brain, to neuronal circuits, and a theory that explains perhaps at the phenomena level as to what a resolution of depression might be, namely an unlocking of consciousness to a wider field and an opening of the personality. Uh, so here come pieces together that have not been stitched together by science as yet, but we may see the outline of where science might go. The other lesson that I see from this is that the way we approach the treatment of depression currently is probably misguided and largely ineffective. Perhaps we need to look towards the psychedelic type mechanism to give our patients more rapid and sustained relief. It's interesting to note that those changes induced by psychedelics often last for months or longer after a single psychedelic session. Welcome back. Today we will discuss the evolution and revolution really, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area of a movement called microdosing of psychedelic drugs. Now uh, there is also a counter idea, namely that it requires a mystical experience. Uh, an experience out of the ordinary that has a number of criteria in order for the salutary, the healing effects of uh, psychedelic drugs to really manifest. We will put this into a different framework, namely the antidepressant mechanism of psychedelics. A recent paper has appeared which speaks to the biochemistry uh, really to the molecular biology as well of the psychedelic uh, effect on brain circuitry, perhaps or likely mediating its antidepressant effect. So here then is the paper. Psychedelics promote structural and functional neuroplasticity. The paper that just recently appeared a few weeks ago. So we will now begin to put this into a context, namely the structure resemblance of psychedelic drugs to existing compounds. This slide, namely norepinephrine and mescaline. You can see the norepinephrine molecule is quite intact almost here if you compare it to the mescaline molecule, which has a couple of three methyl groups attached to the indole ring structure. Now mescaline is the drug that Aldous Huxley was given and that he described so vividly in his book, The Doors of Perception. When I was a young medical student in Hamburg in the late 1960s, somebody, perhaps in a, a pharmacology class, put the uh, structure of norepinephrine on the blackboard and uh, contrasted it with the structure of mescaline. And that similarity, that profound difference, induced by a few methyl groups in terms of the 
phenomenology and the pharmacology, the powerful effects that this slight chemical substitution had, moved me into getting into psychiatry. This one uh, figure on the blackboard determined really the rest of my professional life and I thought I'd put this up here so to introduce you to Mescaline and also to that event that brought me here to making this video many, many years later. So here is Aldous Huxley and his book, The Doors of Perception. In fact, he was introduced to uh, Mescaline by Humphrey Osmond, and uh, he then wrote the famous book, The Doors of Perception. Um, psychedelic uh, is a name that these two uh, people came up with, uh, meaning mind manifesting from psychos and uh, delos, um, uh, two Greek terms combined, uh, indicating that these drugs can show you what your mind is capable of and let you have access to the recesses of the mind. So here then is what Aldous Huxley had and what many believe is required for um, psychedelic drugs to have the powerful effects on man in terms of alleviating depression, for example. Namely, a mystical experience consisting of feelings of unity, sacredness, ineffability, being at a loss for words, there is just nothing in the language that is commensurate with the experience. Peace and joy, as well as an impression of having transcended in some way space and time, and a so-called noetic sense, the feeling that something was disclosed about a truth, about reality, um, that is also difficult to put into words, but has a very powerful convincing effect that this disclosure is at once personal and yet of universal significance and may very well shape the rest of the course of your life. So a true mystical experience then needs um, these all six of these characteristics. And this has been then incorporated into some rating scales in research having been done at Johns Hopkins uh, by Roland Griffiths. Uh, who wrote a pathfinding paper in 2006 which opened the doors, not of perception, but the door of reintroducing the psychedelics into legitimate university-based research. Now, our focus is on depression. And as it happens, microdosing has been going on for a very long time, namely with a drug called ketamine. Many of you may have heard the ketamine story. Uh, the one drug in psychiatry that can alleviate a profound depression, even treatment-resistant depression, within some hours, not in days or weeks. It can also abolish suicidal ideations within minutes or hours. Now, the ketamine story really uh, is a story of uh, microdosing because the doses used in ketamine studies are all sub-anesthetic and sub-dissociative. In other words, you're not supposed to feel anything. You're not supposed to have a experience of any psychedelic or other kind or not experience psychotic symptoms to any extent, but you're flying in under the radar. And what happens is that profound things happen at the biochemical level that we will discuss shortly and then contrast with those produced by psychedelic drugs. Now, let's define depression. Depression as a loss of dendritic spines and dendrites uh, as a hallmark of depression and other neuropsychiatric disorders, especially in the uh, prefrontal cortex. So that's our definition. And anything that improves the uh, functional capability and anatomical integrity of dendrites and dendritic spines, we would predict has an antidepressant effect. So here then is an illustration. On the left panel, you see the effect of chronic stress as it causes atrophy of neuronal processes and a decrease in synapse number. Now the left side of the panel shows you the 100 micron uh, 
uh, scale here, so we will see the entire uh, cell body and the dendrite arborizing on top. And on the right hand side, you have a five micrometer scale. So that is uh, diving into the substructure of the dendrite and you're looking at dendritic spines. Those areas that are so critical in communication with other dendrites and in synapse formation. This is where computing, this is where the business end of the dendrite is located. And you can see that in the control you have a bunch of healthy bubbly spines and on the right hand panel you see that the spines have been decreased in number and uh, don't look so healthy. So we then define depression as a disease a decrease in the number of neuronal processes or dendrites and in the number of dendritic spines. This is the uh, summary sketch on ketamine. So we have um, ketamine being administered. Uh, presumably it interacts with the NMDA receptor. These receptors are all over the cortex, just like the 5H2A receptors for serotonin are all over the cortex. And it's thought that the uh, binding of ketamine then uh, inhibits the uh, NMDA receptor and in some indirect mechanism releases a volley of uh, neuronal activity um, triggering the entire cerebral cortex, kind of like an explosion of excitatory activity. And as a result of which, we get uh, increased spine density. And you see in the middle here, the uh, red marker M Tor. We will unravel this um, and explain to you where this came from and what this really means. So microdosing then sub-dissociative doses of a compound in depression has been around for many years and predates the renaissance of the psychedelic third wave, as it's called. The re-emergence of psychedelic research in respectable research centers. So here we do a deep dive into the synapse where ketamine is supposed to act. On the left hand side you see a glutaminergic neurons. Those neurons which are the most predominant excitatory neurons in the cortex. You see all the wonderful things that are going on after glutamate binds to either the AMPA or NMDA receptor. Namely, um, there is a release of a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which leads to uh, increased production of vesicle cy cytoskeleton elements and those that are required to keep the uh, neuron healthy and to have it functional. Now, with a prolonged stress on the right-hand side, you can see that the number of receptors have shriveled. And this is in part due to the fact that um, th those growth factors, BNDF, have not been properly produced. Something is missing in the cascade. Synaptic proteins are not made. And um, we are winding up with a shriveled and incapacitated neuron. In comes uh, ketamine in the next slide. And you can see here uh, by blocking the NMDA receptor, you have an indirect effect on the uh, neuron, which leads to massive increase in firing rates. AMPA receptors are activated, and again you see the uh, mentioning here of mTOR, uh, which we will uh, elucidate in a second. So ketamine is uh, used to, is uh, believed to cause a burst of glutamate. This is thought to um, uh, uh, is via disinhibition of GABA interneurons. The tonic firing of these GABA interneurons is driven by NMDA receptors. So by blocking the NMDA receptor, you release the inhibition from GABA neurons and you cause a uh, global burst of um, these um, neurons in the cortex, leading to activation of all kinds of cellular processes that keep the neuron healthy and leads to uh, intact dendrites and dendritic spines. The next slide you see what stress does. Uh, you see uh, glucocorticoids in the red box bind to the uh, glucocorticoid receptor uh, 
which can translocate into the nucleus and inhibit mTOR. Uh, we have uh, talked about the epigenetics in the previous lecture on um, the glucocorticoid system and the uh, control of the glucocorticoid responsive gene and the number of glucocorticoid receptors uh, being critically involved in dampening and modulating stress response. So here again, you find this player, mTOR, being uh, intimately involved with stress responsiveness. And as a result of being shut down or modulated, you see a decrease in production of those neuronal elements, including uh, glutamate receptors, which should be required to keep the neuron healthy and functioning. So that's our groundwork for ketamine and our uh, basis to evaluate the um, psychedelics for their antidepressant efficacy. Now, in order to understand microdosing, we need to do a brief historical excursion. Here is Dr. Uh, Fetterman, Jim Fetterman, who wrote a book, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. And in this book, he mentions the uh, possibility of using sub uh, psychedelic doses of, for example, LSD at 10 to 20 micrograms per every fourth day or so, rather than a full psychedelic dose of 100 to 150 or maybe even 200 micrograms, triggering a full-blown psychedelic episode. Uh, nevertheless, microdosing um, has been described by many of those who've tried it as being very effective in alleviating depression, anxiety, increasing focus, attention, and general well-being. Now, as a warning, there are no controlled trials of microdosing that I know about that have demonstrated its effectiveness. So all this is speculative and based on anecdotal reports. However, there is a parallel here to the ketamine microdosing. And now, if we can demonstrate that um, psychedelics tap into the same biochemical pathway that ketamine does in order to produce this antidepressant effect by stimulating dendrites and dendritic spines, then we may have a story here that is worth pursuing. So here then is a, a couple. Um, this is um, Ailet Waldman and her husband Michael Chabon. And both are uh, accomplished people. He is a novelist, a Pulitzer Prize winning. She is an attorney uh, and a novelist, uh, among other things. And uh, she described that she was uh, depressed, uh, seriously depressed and even suicidal at one point in her life. Uh, she was so, so profoundly depressed that she looked through a medicine cabinet and checking out what might be available uh, in sufficient doses to kill herself. It was at that time that the uh, Fadiman, Jim Fadiman's book, kind of accidentally fell into her hands. And she discovered um, the literature on microdosing. And she describes um, in a book called A Really Good Day, how she used this technique to pull herself out of the depressive episode with microdosing. Before she uh, did this, uh, a number of research studies, uh, particularly from Johns Hopkins out of the lab of Roland Griffiths, have put the psychedelics back on the map as being important compounds in looking at depression. Now, these were studies um, that were approved by the FDA. Uh, waivers have been granted uh, to obtain the psychedelic drugs. Uh, because all of them are Schedule One by the FDA. Now, Roland Griffith is an extremely well-respected researcher for many years at Johns Hopkins, and uh, he had the, the street cred uh, and the gravitas to be able to get this through, and he shows that uh, psilocybin can improve depression and anxiety in perhaps the most difficult clinical situation known to man namely patients facing life-threatening cancer, which is often associated with profound depression, anxiety, and existential angst, which um, 
there is nothing in psychiatry that really can assist these folks. And uh, this group at Johns Hopkins has found that psychedelic doses of psilocybin, for example, can in many patients dramatically within a day or so rewire, reset their expectations, their acceptance, their mood, and decrease their anxiety, uh, making the dying process much easier and uh, transforming really not only their remaining life but also transforming their death. So this is then the uh, clinical background that we're dealing with. I'll show you now a result here from Imperial College London where um, Carhart Harris, the leader of the psychedelic research group at that institution, has also done a study on treatment resistant depression. Now they selected patients that have been depressed for 10, 20 or more years, had tried up to 11 antidepressant medications and just were totally at the end of their rope. Nothing really had worked. So these patients also were given a psychedelic dose under careful conditions uh, with a uh, guide, a psychotherapeutic guide. There was um, psychotherapeutic preparation before the psychedelic experience. There was a guide present during the experience and there was sessions afterwards to integrate the meaning of the experience for these patients. And you can see that there was a profound decrease in the level of depression in many of these patients uh, within a day or so. There's nothing in psychiatry that has ever achieved this kind of immediate response. And it's rather striking that we're sitting on this uh, gold mine of um, this powerful tool and uh, uh, academic psychiatry, with the exceptions of a few centers, is not really doing anything about it. Ketamine is slowly making its way to the clinical arena, but who knows how long uh, psilocybin or LSD will take to be rehabilitated to such an extent that it can make its way into the clinic and have profoundly depressed patients. Truth is that our antidepressants are lousy drugs. Only uh, a fraction of our patients respond to them at all. And if so, usually not to the extent that they are in full remission for any period of time. In the next slide, you see another uh, presentation of the data. It was a small group of patients, so it can only be considered to be a pilot study. But you can see that the effect was lasting for several months. The other thing that many groups, uh, John Hopkins, um, NYU and Imperial College of London observed is there seemed to be profound personality changes in patients who have undergone a profound psychedelic experience. Namely, the uh, uh, measure of openness, the personality trait of openness seems to have been that permanently changed, increased, which is of course considered to be a very positive event in a patient's life and had heretofore been considered totally impossible to change a, a personality trait with a single administration in a, psychother a psychotherapeutic setting of a psychedelic drug. So let's discuss now how does this stuff actually work. Well, you all know that psychedelics bind to the serotonin receptor, namely the 5H2A receptor in the cortex. And in this picture you see that the entire cortical surface is red here, indicating the high density of these receptors. These receptors are in those cortical areas that are most critical for integrative function, the frontal cortex, and the association cortices uh, in which we do our thinking, our concept formation, our monitoring of our self-concept and other higher powered functioning such as this. And you can see here again, these compounds stimulate structural plasticity by activating the mammalian target of rapamycin. So I think it's about time that we get to uh, unpack what this is. Here then is a study that um, was in the first slide in which we will uh, 
discuss in a minute. You see here a number of psychedelic drugs of different families, namely from the amphetamine family, the tryptamine family, and the uh, lysergic acid family. Uh, so these are three different families uh, that have been uh, modified. They all bind to the 5H2A receptor, and it is likely but not conclusively shown that then the end result is a massive glutamine, glutamate release, triggering glutamate receptors, just like in the ketamine case. And that then leads to the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor and increased neuroplasticity. So that is the theory. In the next slide, here we have mTOR, to whet your appetite one more time. So mTOR is a mechanistic or mammalian target of rapamycin. It was discovered in 1964 on the island of Rapa Nui. We know it at, as Easter Island. A group of, I believe, Canadian researchers went to distant uh, areas of the planet to find virgin soil samples to discover bacteria and evaluate them for the utility for pharmaceuticals, in particular antifungal medication. So here is, of course, the uh, iconic picture of um, Easter Island. And uh, this, in the soil of this island, a bacterium was found, which uh, produced a antifungal agent named rapamycin. Rapa from the first syllable of Rapa Nui, and mycin for antifungal. So this compound uh, was found to be antifungal, but it also had strong immunosuppressant effects. That was at that time considered very undesirable. The compound was shelved and was forgotten about until it made an appearance much later. So here the milestones of research on rapamycin and mTOR. A group in Basel, Switzerland, became very interested to identify what is the target of rapamycin. How does it do its antifungal activity? And they worked with yeast. Now, yeast is a wonderful organism to do genetics with. And you can do genetic screening very efficiently and identify mutants that are resistant to rapamycin that then allow you to home in on the uh, rapamycin target. Once this was accomplished, uh, the target in mammalian cells was identified. And then, of course, a slew of other activities took place here. Most recently, of course, the involvement of mTOR, or the mammalian target of rapamycin, in neuroscience, namely the uh, production and maintenance of growth factors in the neuronal cell. The uh, key effect of mTOR in bacterial and mammalian cells seems to be cell growth, not cell division, but rather making those elements in the cell that allow the cell to grow in size and make those components and machineries that are necessary to expand cell volume. So in our case, of course, as a neuron grows, one of the likely outcomes will be the growth of those extensions of the neurons such as dendrites and the uh, spines and the apical dendrites. So here then is TOR as at a universal controller of cell growth, protein synthesis, nucleotide synthesis, lipid synthesis, on and on. All this is controlled by mTOR. Uh, there are some specific disorders uh, linked to dysregulation of mTOR signaling such as uh, cardiac hypertrophy and tuberous uh, sclerosis and perhaps some cancers. And here are some mTOR signaling, signalings in obesity and I think we might want to add depression as a possible mechanism that is mTOR related. Now, let's get back now with all these preambles to our target paper. So here we have the so-called psychoplasmogens. Now we have psychedelics, so the authors of this paper suggest a new term, psychoplasmogens, namely psychedelics that increase neuronal plasticity. 
and they all do this by increasing spine density and the um, uh, spine, uh, the um, density of, of synaptic connections uh, that are a result of the same. So here then is the key result of the paper. Here is the number of um, branches in the um, spine, in the um, and, and neurites, the, the spine processes. You can see that compared to the vehicle DOI, which is the amphetamine derived a psychedelic, the DMT, the tryptamine derived psychedelic, and LSD all increase the number of branches in these um, spines um, in a very powerful and substantial way. In the next slide, you see looking the uh, spinogenesis and epigenesis and functional plasticity uh, with LSD here being the leader on the left hand side, DMT and DOI all being very effective. And you can see that the growth of these spines and uh, uh, synaptic processes is quite remarkable. The next slide, you can see that. Um, uh, synaptic markers, both presynaptic and postsynaptic, are increased. And you can see that on the right hand side, that new synapses, in fact, are being formed as a result of exposure to these three um, psychedelic drugs in vitro. Here you see a, a, a quantitative aspect of this um, the synaptic density synaptic size, the, um, the density of the uh, vesicles for glutamine is increased as well as the postsynaptic density, PSD95, a marker for the postsynaptic membrane, all are increased in a uniform kind of a way, giving you the picture of a massive growth spurt of all components of dendrites, dendritic spines, presynaptic and postsynaptic components of the business end of computation in the cortex. The next slide shows you a very nice picture of the uh, uh, spines and the spinal processes here on the apical dendrite. You can see the DMT on top uh, and at the bottom the, the apical and uh, proximal dendrites are showing explosive growth, uh, especially the dendritic processes. And expo on exposure to DMT. And the next slide, this has uh, consequences for the firing rate of um, neurons. So you can uh, record from uh, neurons, uh, from the pyramidal cell neurons, in uh, slices obtained from animals exposed to, exposed to uh, DMT and you can see that the firing rate on the right hand side here is significantly increased in those um, neurons that have been exposed in vivo to a dose of DMT. So not only do you produce more of the components of presynaptic terminals, dendritic spines and processes and postsynaptic densities, but you also produce the resulting increase in the firing rate. Speaking to the idea that a global increase, a massive increase in firing pattern through these cortical neurons is underlying the effect on the um, depressive symptomatology and producing those components in the neuron which tend to be associated with a healthy functioning cortex. Now, how about mTOR, of which we made such a big deal? Well, if you uh, associate your experiments and you pre-treat the preparations with rapamycin, you can see here that rapamycin abolishes the effect of psychedelic drugs on the um, effects on the spine and the dendrites that we have discussed previously. Basically, the effect is flattened out. Strongly suggesting that in some way, mTOR, this critical component of cell growth, is involved in the effect of psychedelic drugs. So then, in summary, what we can say is that 
um, psychedelics from four different structural classes, the amphetamines, tryptamines, and agulines, uh, iboga as well, uh, are potent psychoplastogens. In other words, by binding to the 5H2A receptor and being psychedelic, they also terrifically in increase acutely plasticity at the neuronal level. So although the molecular targets of ketamine and psychedelics are different, namely the NMDA receptor and the 5H2A receptor uh, respectively, they appear to cause similar downstream effects on the structural plasticity by activating mTOR. So there is a long-standing debate in the field now concerning whether the subjective effects of psychedelics are really necessary for the therapeutic effects. In other words, do you need a mystical experience to benefit from the antidepressant quality of psychedelic drugs? Now, people experimenting in microdosing would say, no, you can take microdoses which do not uh, affect your daily functioning, except perhaps uh, increase a sense of concentration and well-being, but um, you still benefit by decrease in depression as evidenced uh, from uh, a let's video that I showed you earlier. Now what then about a psychedelic dose with a mystical experience? Well it's possible that at a massive dose you increase the penetrance and the extent of the um, glutaminergic discharge induced um, processing and uh, synaptic plasticity that one single shot may last you a lifetime in a sense. That is such a massive organization which of course also goes along with uh, massive interference in your life and perhaps some associated risk. So in my view we can say that small microdoses of psychedelics will introduce synaptic plasticity in the same way as ketamine, which has been shown to be a powerful antidepressant. Now, ketamine is not so easy to administer, and I think that microdosing is a much more likely solution to many chronic depressive patients because used at 10 micrograms or 50 micrograms every four days without any psychological effects may keep you in remission from your severe depression. So hopefully research can demonstrate that in a double-blind fashion, which should be easier to double-blind than a full-blown psychedelic experience. Everybody knows when they got a psychedelic and everybody knows when they didn't get it. With microdosing, you would never know. You would hardly feel any different in terms of the uh, altered perception and altered uh, state of consciousness. So it might be much easier to prove efficacy in, in depression in the microdosing paradigm using double-blind technology. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this uh, somewhat deep dive into psychedelics and its uh, their inter antidepressant properties, which hopefully uh, will come to market uh, within my lifetime. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you soon at Behavioral Health 2000.